This episode is sponsored by Manscaped. Hello, amateurs. Welcome to another episode of the Amateur Rugby Podcast, here to help soothe your Sunday morning hangover with some wonderful rugby chat about the grassroots of the game. I'm your host, Tim, and I've got another fantastic guest for you today. This man is a former rugby player, now turned rugby referee, and he's passionate about supporting other referees too. Oh, and he's also a keen carp angler. Please welcome Mr. Matt Groves. Matt, how are you doing? Very well, thanks, Tim. How are you? Very well, very well. Welcome to the show. And I can't leave that last bit of the intro without asking what your personal best carp is. Wow. Uh, so in the UK, uh, it's 4212. Uh, oh. And over in France, uh, 64 pounds. Holy moly. So you're a you're yeah. a proper, proper one. You've got some big beasts on the resume there. Uh, I do, yes. I, I wish I had a lot more time um, to do it. I've not, not been able to do it for, um, well, not as much as I want to for the last couple of years since I started a, uh, a new venture. But it's um, it's something that I treat as a as escapism away from the real world. You know, I get away from work, get away from um, wife, kids, leave my mobile phone in the van and just go and sit in nature for a few hours with a, a glass of red wine and nothing but me for company, which is bliss. <laughs> Absolutely. And as the world gets more and more busy, I can see that becoming more and more of a, a real, real pleasure. OK, let's yeah. talk about the rugby stuff. Um, let's start with you as a player, Matt. We're going to go on and talk about yeah. the referee and stuff in great detail. But uh, how did you get into the game in the first place and what kind of a player were you? <laughs> um, so some would say not a particularly good one. Um, so I first got into uh, into rugby when I went to secondary school. Um, that it was a, it was a mandatory thing that we had to do. I'd never played rugby before. My dad um, played a bit of rugby and was into, into rugby and it, it kind of got me to watch a bit on the telly and I didn't understand it at all. I was I was into football as a, as a kid, um, but not very good at football. Um, was throwing a rugby ball in a PE lesson at school and realised actually I didn't need to be able to kick it. I could catch it and I could run with it and I could run through people. Um, and I was just kind of better at it. So the, the PE master, uh, Mr. Meller, got me in touch with the local club, Paviors, uh, up in Nottinghamshire, where I lived at the time. And I never really kind of looked back. It was it was then my, my big passion. Um, played age grade rugby at Paviors through uh, through to, to Colts level. Um, played representative rugby at age grade as well, Nottinghamshire and Notts Links Derby. Played rugby at, at uni. Um, and then after uni, came back, rejoined Paviors, and unfortunately, through, well, various life circumstances, um, uh, the job that I had was, was shift work. Um, then I moved to South Yorkshire, moved to Sheffield with my then girlfriend, uh, now wife. Um, and back then, there was not a lot of rugby played in, in South Yorkshire, rugby union anyway. Um, so I ended up kind of drifting away from, from rugby in my, in my early 20s. Um, still kept it interest, but not as, a, not as an active player. Um, it was only really when my uh, my eldest son expressed an interest when he was about five years old. Um, so I did what any any normal parent would do, took him down to my local rugby club, which was uh, Colville in Leicestershire, where, where I still am. Um, took him down. Within a week, I put my hat in the ring to help out with coaching. There was, you know, it's probably the, the same scene at rugby clubs up and down the country every Sunday morning. There's, a, there's you know, loads of five-year-olds running around and you've got a coach trying to herd cats. Um absolute carnage so um i said to the coach like you know, i played a bit of rugby happy to help out so that that was me coaching the club then put me on kind of structured learning program of, of getting the coaching qualifications and um uh, and all the other bits and pieces and the, you know the, the the progressive stuff that they that they do with uh, with rugby and all the safeguarding and safety and first aid and all those things really really good kind of structured um structured program um Within a few weeks of uh, being back involved in coach, well, back involved coaching rugby for the first time, uh, I got uh, got talked into putting my boots back on. So at this point, I'd have been, you know, early thirties. I'd done no physical activity for a long time, you know, best part of a decade. Uh, and one of the one of the old clubmen, Simon, now a really good mate of mine, um, taught me into into playing. So that was me playing rugby, just you know, social stuff, third team rugby, having a laugh just enjoying being being active again, enjoying being around the game again. Um, did that for, for a couple of seasons, then made it into the second team, which was, you know, absolutely, you know, great, great progression. Uh, and then a season or so later, um, 
I'm, I made my debut for the club first team and I'm, well, I don't know, either one of the oldest, if not the oldest person to make their debut for the club first team. I, I was 36 years old and it was, and so I want to be absolutely crystal clear on this for, for you, Tim, and all of the, 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 the audience. It was entirely down to my fitness and skill, nothing to do with the fact that the first team hooker picked up an injury. That was just coincidental timing. It was all to do with my own performance. Um, but then I quickly realised I was getting too old, couldn't keep up, and I was, I was not going to be a first team player. For I was there literally to fill in while the well there while Henry was injured, um, and all this time I've been coaching. And um, as you know, most of the listeners will be will be aware. As an age grade coach, you know, going from under fives through to under thirteens, there are no referees. The coaches do do the refereeing. So I was coaching with a, a small number of people, you know, three or three or four of us coaching. No one else was interested in refereeing. And that's something that I found is, you know, you, you go to fixtures around the county or out of county, very few age grade um, coaches really want to do refereeing. So I was quite happy with it. I had no, no problem with it, quite enjoyed it. So I was doing all the refereeing and that's kind of where I, where I got started. Um, yeah. And that, that, that was me then kind of not playing anymore, still involved in age grade coaching, but interested in, in refereeing. So I think it was the end of the, um, what would it be, the eighteen nineteen season was involved in the Leicestershire under 13s county tournament. You know, I'm sure they have this up and down the country, you know, pool stages followed by some knockouts and then a, and a, and a final all on one day, glorious sunshine, barbecues going at the club, you know, really good day out. We got knocked out really early, but I was asked to, to stay around and, and referee some of the latter stages and then asked to, to referee the final. And I thought, Do you know what, if people think I'm, not crap at this i'll give it a go so i spoke to uh one of the old guys at, at my club um lovely lovely old chap roger cairns um refereed probably longer than you and i have been alive um this 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 guy um he pointed me in, in the right direction gave me a load of good um tips and advice on, on how to get started and kind of what to do and what not to do um so i did the qualification um in November 19, I think it would have been, uh, and then joined the Leicestershire Referee Society and have been refereeing, well, I say refereeing ever since, obviously, within a couple of months of actually starting refereeing, um, rugby stopped. Um, so there was then obviously a massive gap before we before we restarted. So it was quite a long-winded answer to what was a simple question. So yeah, that, that was me as a player, and that's my journey into into where I am now. I'm, uh, I, I do pitch in a little bit with the coaching, but my lad's now progressed through from age grade and is now into senior rugby and I help out with the seniors, but from a, from a refereeing perspective rather than from a coaching perspective. So we're going to do some pre-season work and I'll be working with the guys on, uh, on some of the new law changes that are coming in. Not that there's that many this season, but like last season, for example, we needed to cover quite a lot of ground in terms of tackle height DLVs, for example, but that's my kind of involvement in the club now. Uh, aside from refereeing and then obviously come back to the club on a Saturday night after I've been wherever I've been and have a few pints with the lads. Amazing. Amazing. What a great story. Now, what, there's a couple of things I want to dig into. Firstly, when you got back in that first game playing, when you were sort of in your thirties, hadn't done any kind of physical activity for quite some time. I just want to dig deeper into that. What was your kind of mindset? How were you feeling as you sort of laced the boots up to go and take the field? So I, I'd done a couple of training sessions literally like one or two training sessions where I struggled to make it beyond the warm up. You know, running around with the with the lads that were, you know, a lot younger than me, I, I was I was blowing, absolutely blowing just at the, the warm up. So lacing my boots up, I was I was dead excited. I was really, really pumped to be to be playing again. But I was also filled with trepidation, knowing that the game lasts for 80 minutes. Um and, and also, you know, physicality. Um, something that I, I'm sure a lot of the listeners will be familiar with, that, that when you stop playing rugby, your, your body goes soft. You don't, you don't, you can't handle the contact in the same way. Whereas if you, if you keep going, you, your body's just used to, to that kind of contact. So I was, I was a little bit nervous about, you know, going into live scrummaging. I've not been involved in a live, live scrummage for over, over 10 years. Um, so yeah, it was, it was, it was nervy. It was nervy, but you know, I was amongst some, some, some mates. It was, it was social rugby at the end of the day. Um, we actually didn't have a, have a referee that day. One of the uh, one of the old guys from the club had to take his club kit off to, uh, to to referee the game. It's you know it was typical 
grassroots third team social rugby. You know, it was um, uh, it was a laugh. Thankfully, we had a few replacements, so I was uh, I didn't need to last the full eighty minutes, and it was just rolling sub. So I was you know kind of on and off. I, I think I played quite a few positions that day as well, Tim. I was um, uh, I started at hooker, went to uh, went to tight head, played a bit on the blind side, uh, and then a little bit in the centre as well, which is um, quite scary given that I'm no centre. <laughs> well, that's one of the joys of playing real social rugby, third fifteen rugby, isn't it? Like you, yeah. you'll end up having a wildly different experience compared to you know when you took it seriously. Um, and that's yeah. one of the things that I'm trying to do with the podcast is really to encourage people to get back out there if they have played in the past or, you know, refined rugby as well, uh, along with sticking in it as long as they can. So what would you say, how quickly would you say you kind of refound your feet and sort of got back involved and the, and the physicality didn't affect you as much as it did in that first game? I'd say it's probably a small number of weeks. Um, you know, the first game, I, 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 was, I was like broke until Wednesday, if I'm entirely honest with you, Tim. You know, my, my um, you know, you, you get in the car on a Sunday morning and, you know, you try and look left and right to turn out of a T-junction and you can't without moving your entire upper body. Um, but, you know, that, that that's something that, you, again, your body just, just kind of just acclimatises to it, it adapts to quite quite quickly, I felt, quite quickly. The thing that took longer to get back was any degree of cardiovascular fitness. That, that took much longer to, um, to to come back. But the main thing that came back really quickly was my love for the game. And, you know, I was, you know, chatting to the guys in the bar afterwards. I'm sat, you know, found myself saying, why have I spent so long away from this game when, you know, I just, I just love being part of it. You know, I'm sure you found the same, you know. You know, I know you've, you've kind of carried on playing yourself, but, you know, you must have had some, some kind of experience of like that, of, you know, it's a bit of time away that you then question why you've spent any time away from the game yeah absolutely I have and I'm planning on playing some games this coming season for sure I'm going to try and get the boots back on myself um now something you mentioned with the age grade stuff and people not wanting to step forward and referee mm -hmm. my question is why 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 do you think that is why do you think so many people are kind of reticent to pick up the whistle even for some a game you know five-year-olds or six-year-olds when there's no there's nothing on it really you know you're just there to do your best um but people are reticent why do you think that is so i I've, i i don't have any data or evidence to back up what i'm about to say this is just you know kind of anecdotal stuff and things that things that i've observed so i i think there's a there's a very much a tapering off of of, of people being prepared to, to referee that at the your very young age where it's you know tag rugby i i think there's more people that are going to be prepared to to have a go at refereeing because there's not a lot to it really you're not actually really refereeing the game at that kind of age you're more there as a guide and as a coach to just encourage the right kind of behaviors and remember you know remind the kids that they should be running forwards and that the game is about you know making progress and all those kind of things it's less about refereeing so you know, imagine less than on, on a chart and I'm seeing it kind of then tapering off as you go up through the through the age grades into what is more structured, more competitive rugby. Not that under 13 rugby is a massively competitive thing, but it is it's a far more structured game. And so I think that some of the reluctance around people getting involved to, to referee is it, it, probably twofold. I think there's a there's an element of it involves a lot more running around. So a lot of those, um, you know, parents, other coaches that are, are, are on the sideline maybe don't want to do that level of, of exercise. You know, you're, you're on almost a full size pitch at, at, at 12s and 13s rugby. It's a reasonable amount of running. You know, you've got 25 minute halves. It, it, it's, it's not a, a walk in the park like it is when it's under fives, under sixes tag rugby playing on a tennis court size, size pitch. I think the other big thing, though, is knowledge of how to actually referee the game and what the laws are which makes people a little bit nervous and there's a a general human trait of not wanting to make a mistake in front of a load of people and i, I can ab absolutely empathize with that you know if you if you don't know the laws of the game and you don't know how you go about refereeing a game why would you put yourself in a position why would you run the risk of making a howling mistake in front of two touchlines filled with parents and grandparents and, and spectators. And I, you know, I, I, I get it. I, I, I understand why there is, why there is that, that reluctance. Um, I think that there's, there's a lot more that, that clubs, uh, county bodies, and indeed the RFU could do to help coaches with that, 
with that that refereeing journey. I know it's something that the, the Leicestershire Society are helping out with. There's a uh, some sessions that that we're going to be doing at clubs um, early doors this season to help with getting people more comfortable with with doing that doing that kind of journey. Not necessarily into then as I've done actually becoming a a, a referee, but just so that there's more confidence and competence on Sunday mornings with with age grade rugby. Yeah. What would you say it is, Matt, then, in, in your mindset that made you be able to put all those kind of fears of making a mistake or whatever to the side and continue to, to referee and go and push forward? Um, that's a great question. Um, what is it about me? So I'm, I'm reasonably thick skinned. Um, and I think if you're going to be if you're going to be a, a, a referee at any level, you know, age grade stuff on a Sunday, Saturday afternoon, grassroots stuff up to, you know, to, to higher levels, you need to be thick skinned. And certainly when you look at what happens at the elite level, you absolutely have to be thick skinned because your, you know, your, your, your personal life is impacted by your job. You know, I, I don't know if you've, if you, if you watched the whistleblowers documentary on um, rugby pass. I haven't actually watched it. No. I'll tell you what, let's, let's put a link in the, in the description. It's absolutely fantastic. I believe it's free. You, you need to sign up to an account on, on rugby pass tv.com i can't remember the, the url um but it's a documentary that follows the elite referees at the last world cup and it is really really insightful into the impact of refereeing at the elite level and what that what impact it has on your personal life your wife your kids it's really really interesting i recommend everyone goes goes and looks at it but anyway sorry coming back to being thick-skinned you need to be thick-skinned you need to not take things personally um, you know, I'm sure we've all seen those sandwich boards at the side of pitches on Sunday mornings that say something like, you know, this is not the Six Nations, the coaches are volunteers, the referees are human, we're all here to enjoy ourselves. That is obviously, that's, you know, core values. And, and I think that's that's something that we, that we need to we need to acknowledge. You do get the odd comment from parents, from spectators, from players now, unfortunately. So you need to have that resilience to, to be able to, to cope with it. Um, I think the other thing, Tim, is I really enjoy it. And so if you get enjoyment from something, you kind of, it's not really taking the rough with the smooth. That's not the, it's not the right, not the right term at all. But you, if you get this amount of enjoyment from something, you're quite happy that there's some, some little niggles and some things that aren't quite right with it because the main thing is that you're out there and you're enjoying doing what you're doing, whatever that is. It could be refereeing, could be playing, could be golfing. It doesn't matter, you know. I think golf's actually a good example because I'm rubbish at that, but I still enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, me too, me too. Now, um, in terms of the uh, comments that you get, I'm going to give a very specific example here of a friend of mine who loves abusing, in inverted commas, the referee, but in, in it's pantomime. It's pure pantomime. He's doing it all as a joke. And it comes across that way, I'm sure. Have you ever come across that kind of experience? Uh, does that resonate with you at all? And if so, it, is it a problem for you? Um, I have come across those, those, those kind of players. You know, within I mean, within every uh, within every county, there's always those kind of um, you know jester character within um, within within certain clubs that that have that kind of relationship with with referees. And I think as long as it, as you say, as long as it's done with the right spirit and the right intention that it is, it is being done for amusement purposes, then I've, I've absolutely no, no problem with that. You know, there's a couple of lads within Leicestershire that that I see when I referee and, you know, it's, it's just a giggle. It's part of the experience. But I think something that everyone needs to be mindful of is that everyone's got a different threshold for where where that line is and that's a very very difficult thing to 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 predict and to to make sure that you're you're adapting and you're tailoring your behavior so that you're not crossing that line and i think there's there's a lot of behaviors that that, that players can um can can adapt and 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 to to learn in order to effectively engage with a with a match official irrespective of what level of what level of rugby it is you know you see you see this at the elite level, and I'm sure Tim, you en enjoy watching Joe Marler for his antics and his uh, his banter. It's it's part of the game, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Now, in terms of that, because you kind of mentioned it uh, in passing, there saying more so players nowadays. Are you seeing yeah. a trend where more players feel like they can talk to the referee more often? And do you think that is a result of what they're seeing on the television? Uh, so. 
Uh, yes, absolutely. There is a a, a, a marked increase. Um, the, the the RFU released some uh, some some data and some statistics on this, and and that shows unequivocally that there is an increase in um, in abusive behaviour towards match officials um, at the grassroots level. That is, you know, with, without question, the data clearly shows that. Um, anecdotally, I would say yes, it is increasing. Um, is that down to what we see at the elite level? I think yes, there is, there is a part part of it is what we see at the elite level, and so in terms of how we as a sport, and I think everyone has a part to play in this, Tim, players, officials, coaches, spectators, parents, club staff, everyone has got has got something to, to, to play in this to, to solve this problem because it goes against core values. It goes against the respect and the discipline that, that, that we all hold dear in terms of um, treads, you know, teamwork, respect, enjoyment, discipline, sportsmanship. It's at the heart of kind of why we all love rugby. So, yes, it is, I think, something that is filtering down from the from the elite level um i think that there are are things that that can be done to address it thankfully and this is a massive massive double-edged sword for me i don't see it so much from players at age grade rugby where you where you get the the um any any problems any challenges to deal with on a sunday morning or, or afternoon with with sunday morning boys rugby sunday afternoon girls rugby all, all age grade the problems with the sidelines more than often, it's with the sidelines, not with the players at age grade rugby. At senior rugby, it's becoming more a challenge with the players than it is with the sideline. But I think some of that, Tim, is because there's more people on the on the, on the sideline and it just becomes white noise. To me, it's just white noise. You know, I can't hear an individual voice from the touchline on a Saturday because there's more people there. It is literally just white noise to me. But you do hear what the players say because you're a lot closer to them. But on a, on, a, on a Sunday, as I said, you know, it comes from the touchline, not from the players. The double-edged sword that I'm referring to is, I think that's because kids aren't watching enough elite-level rugby. Mm. And I think if they watch more rugby on the television, it would actually create more of a challenge to the match official on a Sunday morning. But actually, I'd still rather that the kids watched more rugby than sat twiddling their thumbs playing on their Xbox or doing whatever else it is that the kids are doing and not watching not watching rugby it's far more accessible it was when when you and i were were, were kids you know all, all i had was rugby special on a sunday afternoon on bbc2 you know it's, I, I couldn't i couldn't live stream games on on youtube or tnt sports or bt or, or whatever you know yeah but i think you're right i think very few younger people watch full games uh, i've got two nephews who are mad about rugby and they really will only ever watch the odd you know really important game and then you know dipping in and out of it probably on the way through as well ladies and gentlemen it's my pleasure to announce that smooth sack summer is officially upon us when you're playing in the summer sun make sure you're groomed from pubes to bum thanks to our friend at manscaped you can make this season your smoothest yet the performance package 5.0 ultra is the ultimate bundle to keep your boys downstairs cool while looking hot Join the 10 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with our exclusive offer. Get 20% off and free shipping when you go to manscaped.com and use the code TARP20. That's T-A-R-P-20. Summertime and the trimming is easy. Have you really done any male grooming if you haven't nicked a nutsack? I know I have and I have to say I've never felt more confident thrashing through the bushes than with the Lawnmower 5.0 Ultra. Every man knows how scary it can get when going for a close shave below the belt. That's why I trust Manscaped for all my sensitive areas. The Manscaped Performance Package 5.0 Ultra has everything you need to prepare that summer bod. The fifth generation trimmer features two interchangeable next-gen skin-safe blade heads, a standard one for taking a little off the top and a new foil blade to go smooth wherever your heart desires. We also have dual LED spotlights to provide contrast on multiple skin tones, three length setting combs and oh did i mention this trimmer is waterproof too beach lake or shower this razor will devour even the strongest pubes now that you have the perfect haircut use manscapes liquid formulations to keep that freshness even at the hottest summer barbecues the crop soother after shave lotion and crop preserver anti-chafe ball deodorant once they touch your sack you'll never go back Get 20% off and free shipping with the code TARP20 at manscaped.com. That's 20% off and free shipping with the code TARP20, T-A-R-P, the Amateur Rugby Podcast, 20 at 
manscaped.com. It's smooth sax summer, boys. Get on board or got left behind. Okay, back to the show. Uh, so in terms of the laws, Matt, what would you say, the average player, what would you say their knowledge of the laws is like? The average player? Oh, we're talking sen- senior player. Yeah. Senior player. So I'd say the, 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 the average player is um, not brilliant, but okay. What I tend to find is that they will, um, they will again, it comes down to your earlier point about picking things up from, uh, from what you see on the television, that there will be something that occurs on the television and then all of a sudden everyone becomes aware of something that they were not previously aware of, even though it's been in, in the laws of the game for ages. Um, so common example, um, I'll say common example, probably a timely example, particularly given the law changes that are coming in in, what is it now, a week and a bit's time, um, I had never seen, as a, as a referee, I have never had a team call for a scrum from a mark until it happened in the World Cup. Now that's been in the law of, of the game as long as I've as long as I've known. But it because no one was aware of it, it never happened at the grassroots level until the South Africans did it, and then all of a sudden it started to happen. No real benefit. I don't think there's actually a huge amount of thought or, you know, tactical or strategic nous going into it. It's just something that was seen on on the telly and people didn't just know a trend. about it. So, you know, it's, it's those kind of things. And uh, so an, another another example would be the uh, the one meter. You know, that's something that until that occurred in one of the Six Nations games, I, I, I don't I genuinely don't remember which one it was, but the ball squirted out, player dived on it, referee pinged it as an infringement. I'd done that multiple times at the grassroots level and the players just stand up and look at you blankly because they've absolutely no idea that that's part of the laws until it happened at the elite level, which is again, massive double-edged sword because it's great that these things are are, are, are being taught out, but it then does encourage some other behaviors. So, you know, swings and roundabouts, I guess. Yeah. And I've got to say, actually, this is one of the things that I really love about rugby is that there's all these little avenues to be discovered in the law and how to play. And and it's constantly evolving. It's one of the things that I find most exciting about the game. So whilst I'm keen for laws to be somewhat simplified, I guess, um, I also I don't want to get rid of some of these like loopholes that people are finding because I find it fascinating. Yeah. Well, and that's it. You know, there's the, the very famous example from, um, what was it, five, six years ago now with uh, Mike Katz and the Italians that they figured out that if you didn't engage in the ruck, there was no offside line. Therefore, you could pretty much go wherever you wanted because there was no offside line. Um, another loophole that's been closing, well, obviously, and again, in a couple of weeks' time, this, this, this loophole is closed with the what's referred to as the DuPont law. So players now need to actually actively retire or be played on side rather than just standing in, in the middle of the field. Now, it's, it's something that is going to hit the elite level game. Does that have an impact at the grassroots? It, it will, but not massive. You know, the, the number of times that you get those slightly lazy forwards hanging around when you've got kick tennis happening, you see that on the telly. You don't see that so much at the, at the grassroots level. A couple of times, maybe, but not 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 very much at all. Um, but it's something that as referees will have to adapt to. You know, you said that it's, it's interesting to find these these little loopholes. It's the kind of thing that to to us at, the, at a relatively low level, something could occur on the pitch for the first time, and we don't know exactly what the what the law is. You know, the law book is a big thing. There's lots and lots of uh, there's lots and lots of words in there, um, and you will get those 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 corner cases that crop up where you're not exactly sure what you can do with, but you know, it comes back to your earlier point about the level of knowledge within within the players, because most players don't know the details. As long as you're confident with the decision that you make and you make a credible decision, most players will just go along with it. You could be massively wrong. In terms of the actual technicalities of the law, you could be hugely wrong. But if you come across, if you sell it and you're confident in it, you can you can get something you can get something wrong. That's one of the, I guess one of the advantages that we have at the grassroots that no one's taking it deadly seriously. So, you know, it's all about enjoyment at the end of the day. It's all about getting out there and, and, and having a laugh. So, Yeah, I was going to ask you for some tips for referees uh, at that level later in the show, but that's a brilliant one. We'll definitely bookmark that one for sure. Now, something else I want to talk about, and this is 
Uh, so when you like people get into discussions about refereeing decisions online, there's often lots of fury about, well, it's so obvious. But then quite often in these situations, the referee happens to be stood on the other side of the ruck, for yeah. example. Um, so what's your thoughts on position in a, as a referee and how that can really change your perspective on certain decisions? So uh, your positioning unlocks so much as a referee. And the thing that unlocks positioning is, is twofold. Knowledge of the game and understanding of the flow of the game, which just gets better and better and better with time. Um, and the other thing is fitness. That you need to work and be fit to get into the right position, to observe things from the right angle, to then make the correct decision. Um, and it's something that every, every referee has to learn. I think that there's some things that if you, if you come into refereeing having not played very much rugby, it's probably easier to learn because you've got less to unlearn, if that makes sense. So one of the things that I certainly found when I started refereeing senior rugby was that I was running the wrong lines and getting into the wrong place because on my, in my head, I wasn't a referee. I was trying to run a support line instead of a match officials line, if that makes sense. You know, I, I wasn't in the right place at the right angles. When it was going from breakdown to breakdown, because my fitness wasn't very good when I started, I was a little bit late to the second breakdown, which then meant I had to work really hard to get anywhere near the third breakdown. But I was still kind of that, that snowball effect of being a little bit late and a little bit out of position and it just gets worse and worse. But come back to your, 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 your question, being in the right position absolutely unlocks making, making good decisions. And also really importantly at the grassroots, making a credible decision that again, it comes back to what, what I said a, a moment ago. You can make a wrong decision, but as long as you make a credible decision, that is far more important than accuracy. At the, and that's a difference between the elite level and the grassroots level, because at the elite level, they need accuracy and credibility. At the grassroots level, credibility is far more important than, than accuracy. So, you you know, you'll see things like, and again, Tim, a massive difference is at elite level, they're a team of four or five people. Most of the time, apart from end of season, um, you know, cup um, semis, quarters, finals, and some of the, the representative rugby, very rare, apart from that end of season period, that we will work at, at my level as a, as a team of three. I'll be out there by myself. The touch judge will be a replacement or a coach. I might be in field, there's a ruck. Um, I see someone on the sideline go, oh, knock on, knock on. If I'm on the other side... I can't make that decision. It's not a credible decision. I can't make it. I always say in my pre-match briefings to, to the captains, I'm not going to make a decision on something that I haven't seen. So if I don't see it, I'm not going to make a decision on it. I'm certainly not going to make a decision based on what your coach is saying has happened in a situation where I've, I've, I've not seen it. If that, does that make sense, Tim? That makes 100% sense. And it's something that I wanted to highlight because I think a lot of people don't think about that kind of stuff when they're watching games. They don't think about where the referee actually is and mm. what field of view he would have to make a decision. Um, obviously, that's less relevant on the TV because they're a team of whatever. Um, yeah. But in grassroots games, certainly, you need to really think about that so that just having that understanding will help you be more respectful towards a referee, I think. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, one of, one of the common questions that I, that I get, particularly from my, from my old man, his, my old man's massive bugbear of rugby at all levels is feeding in the scrum. Is a massive issue with the scrum feed not being straight. And he always, why, why don't the referees pick up on it? And again, I think there's a difference at the, at the elite level that at the elite level, you've got multiple pairs of eyes, you've got TMO, you've, you've got so much ability that you don't need to worry so much about all of the other things. So let me... Let me answer that from a grassroots perspective. Why don't we worry so much about the feed being straight at the grassroots level? So as a single referee in the middle of the field, I've got six guys physically in, in contact with each other at scrum time. I've got 16 guys involved in the scrum. So there's, there's six guys at the front that are all trying to get away with something. I've then got two flankers each side. That's another four guys that's trying to get away with something. I've got two nines that invariably, you know, if anyone's played halfback, they'll know. Nines are an absolute nightmare. They're just full of shenanigans, always something going on. I've got a t I've got seven players over my, let's say, over on my left shoulder as the defensive back line that I need to police them as well. I've got a blind side winger over there that I need to be policing, as well as the attacking team. I'm less bothered, if I'm perfectly honest, Tim, I'm less bothered about where the attacking 10 and the rest of his guys are. They're the lowest priority um, because 
there's not a lot of infringements that they can really do other than coming up a bit too soon and materiality on that, not so much. So you've got so many moving parts that if you can get a scrum formed, you can get the defensive line in the right position, the ball can come in, can get to the eight feet and play away, that's a successful scrum. Everyone's got up safely and the game's moved on. That's the priority. Is the feed perfectly straight all the time? No. Whenever I get asked by, and again, it comes down to nines, you know, nines are always little chirpy people. Um, I very nearly called them something else then. Um, quite often in a game, one of the nines will say, oh, can you watch the feeding, sir? And I'll go, do you want me to watch both feeding or just the opposition? Because I'm going to referee it in a consistent way. What I'll also often say, and this again, it comes down to kind of management of the um, of the grassroots level, is when I think a scrum half is starting to waver beyond what I think is is acceptable, I'll just have a quiet word with them as we walk in towards the next scrum. Just just say nine, you know, at least make an effort to put it in straight, <laughs> and then we can deal with it and we we can move on. But we don't need to stop the game and be giving free kicks because of the feed not being perfectly straight. It's the it's the lowest one, it's almost the lowest priority. You've got so many other moving parts. It's about being pragmatic, just like the, the, the law changes that are coming in. Uh, one of the ones that's being trialed in, uh, I think it's in the, in the Southern Hemisphere, is where a, a line out isn't competitive. The defensive team don't chuck someone up. It's, if it's not straight, play on. Now that's coming into, into a law trial. <clears throat> the reality, Tim, is that most grassroots referees have been doing that for years because yeah, it's the it makes sense. And pragmatic thing to do we're about you know otherwise how many times would we have a completed scrum or a completed line out we wouldn't we'd, we'd have a game that doesn't fly yeah absolutely i agree and i actually think the scrum is in a very healthy place at the moment uh we're getting more completed scrums it's still very much a contest and yeah. you can definitely get tight heads if, if you're dominant over the opposition or win penalties or whatever and it's much safer i think if hookers have got their feet up, flashing around, trying to get the ball, it destabilises everything and you'll see more collapsed scrum. So I understand that people have got a bugbear about it. It's maybe a little bit old school in my opinion, but I think the scrum's in a pretty healthy place. Yeah. And of course, one of the other great things about getting into refereeing is the opportunities that it affords you. So for example, I know that you've refereed the Leicester Tigers Academy recently. So, you know, what is that kind of experience like to be refereeing some elite young players? It's um, it's absolutely fantastic. The, the the standard of rugby that those guys pull together is, is is phenomenal. You know, so much better than the the typical kind of age grade stuff that, that we'll see out on a on a Sunday morning because they are <clears throat> they are the, the, the best of the best. You know, they are the the, the aspire, aspiring young players. Um, most recently, I was involved in one of the selection. Um, uh, so the Tigers Academy is, is built into what they call pods. So there's they're, they're separated geographically. And they brought everyone together uh, for a, a day of some training, but also some uh, some small sided games. So we did uh, eight lots of fifteen minute games, which when you've got these, then this was uh, under sixteens. So these are young fit lads. Um, quite a challenge on <laughs> on me physically to to, to maintain uh, performance for that that period. That, all, those, all those those periods, but the standard of rugby is, is absolutely fantastic. Um, last season, I was involved in the Tigers versus Wasps game, which was the last game of the academy season, which was basically two squads of 30 players, all of them putting their hand up for a contract because they were at the point of going from academy into, into senior rugby. Um, so, you, you know, both teams, all the, all the players were putting their hand up and it was a, a game that was played at pace, skill, uh, I was ARing that. Um, I'm nowhere near fist fast enough to have kept up with that in in the middle. Um, it was one of one of the other Leicestershire referees, Billy Richards, uh, refereed that game, and an absolutely phenomenal game. Then there was no respite. Normally, you know, even at a good standard, there'll be some downtime. I know World Rugby are trying to uh, increase the ball in play time, but the ball in play time at that kind of level was an unbelievable, unbelievably fast game, and it's great to be part of. You know, with most people are involved in refereeing because they love rugby. I love rugby and it's kind of the best seat in the house. You know, you get to be really close to some amazing bits of play. You know, we enjoy good rugby being played in front of us just as much as the people in the stands and on, on the sidelines. Um, the other fantastic opportunity that I, that I had um, uh, last season, tail end of uh, uh, last season, Tigers ladies 
Uh, so Tigers ladies have now moved up to uh, to the women's prem, which means that the Leicester Society, unfortunately, no longer provide referees to them because they're now provided by uh, by the RFU. Um, but I was fortunate enough to be selected to AR uh, Tigers ladies at Walford Road, which is an amazing, amazing. experience. You know, get, getting to you know go into the into the dressing room, the same dressing room that all the big name referees have been in at some point. Walk out onto the onto the pitch. I'll be entirely honest; it wasn't the most attended game that there's ever been at Walford Road. Um, but you know, there's still you know a few hundred people, maybe a couple thousand people in in the stands. It's really, really good experience, and again, really good standard of rugby. Yeah, you mentioned there about uh, having the best seat in the house. Have you ever had any moments where you're so busy, you start watching the game almost as a fan, that you think, "Oh God, I need to, I need to be refereeing this." Yes, there's uh, actually led to a, um, a a really stupid mistake. Um, so I, I, I was watching a, um, a, a there was a, a backs move that, that you know off first phase possession. So they quite clearly got a, a you know training paddock move going, and they've got multiple players running at multiple angles. And it was the timing on it was absolutely amazing. They're really really well rehearsed. I followed the wrong player. They'd sold the the dummy that they were selling to convince the opposition that someone else was getting the ball. Sold me. I was absolutely sold on it. So I, I was following. It was the, the blind side winger coming across on a uh, on an arc. I genuinely thought that he'd got the ball. And I was I I I'd spent five meters following him before I realized that the play was 20 meters in that direction. Because I was just like, that's amazing. Look at that. And it's it's it is it's kind of it's easily done the first couple of times that it happens to you. But then you you quickly kind of learn that, yeah, you, you know, you're close to making a mistake. And it's that kind of, you know, it's the learned behavior. In any walk of life, in any any kind of activity, job, anything that you do, you realise that there's something that you're about to do that's not the right thing to do, and you kind of rein yourself in. And, and yeah, that that happened to me. It was quite quite entertaining, really. That I was I was literally chasing the wrong player. <laughs> that is funny, and it's an important note. Referees do make mistakes; they are human. It All happens every single game, even to the very best. So, yeah, um, time. you know, you, you've seen it yourself, Tim. That, um, and you know, particularly with with comments that we see these days on on, on on social media, if if Wayne Barnes can make a mistake at the elite level when he's got radio comms with his team of four, two two ARs, and his uh, uh, his TMO. It would be a, a fifth, uh, a fifth guy as well, doing all the all the replacement stuff. But in terms of decision making, it's a team of four, and they don't necessarily get everything right all the time. As a grassroots referee, as a team of one, I can absolutely guarantee you that every time a grassroots referee walks out onto the field of thirty-one guys, sorry, thirty-one players on the field, every single one of those thirty-one will make at least one mistake in that game. Every single one, and the referee, and it comes on to one of the things that I'm really, really, really passionate about at the moment is. The referees are the only ones where it is deemed unacceptable for them to make a mistake. And I don't think that's right. I don't think that's right at all. Yeah, I completely agree. I completely concur with that, which is why I highlighted it there. Mm. Um, so hopefully, you know, I think a lot of the people that listen to this podcast are probably on the same wavelength as, as us. But if you're not, just think about that for a second. Now, I, something else I want to talk about is the fact that you just mentioned then about changing in a referee's changing room that all the top referees would have changed in. So, you know, obviously as players, we look up to the international players, the top players, and, we, and we're sort of fans of them. Is it the same with referees? Do you look up to the top guys and, and sort of idolise them? And so it, for one of them? Um, I wouldn't go as far as idolise. Um, certainly yeah. we, we have it's referees that we, we admire. Um, you know, you, you, you can look at the, at the career records of, of, you know, Nigel Owens is an obvious example, Wayne Barnes. Um, uh, I was fortunate enough to, to meet Wayne just a couple of months ago. He came to speak at the Leicestershire uh, end of season uh, referee society dinner. Um, so lucky enough to, to meet him and shake his hand. Um, Idolisation, I think we'd probably stop, stop short of that, but certainly admiration. Um, I think one of the things that we would, as grassroots referees, be well advised to do is to not try to emulate those referees, as in copy the behaviours, certainly from a positioning perspective, because where they are is not the same place that we need to be. It comes down to they're a team of three, team of four. They've got multiple eyeballs on every piece of action. There's a single referee on the field. If you stand, so the most common example, most visible example, probably, Tim, is line-out time. 
at the elite level, you'll quite often see a referee stood at the tail of the line out, almost always at the tail of the line out, right in the middle. That is, from my perspective as a grassroots referee, completely the worst place that I could possibly stand. Because the only one thing that I can see is, was the throw in straight and was there, well, two things, was the contact in the air? They're the only things that I can see. If I put myself in a completely different position, I can't quite see as accurately, was there contact in the air? Was there, uh, was the throw perfectly straight? But I can see everything else. You'll never see, very seldom see an elite level referee anywhere other than the tail of the of, of the line out. The other thing that I think it, 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 that some referees do do fall foul of, and I think I probably did when I first started out, is is this emulation, this, this this trying to copy not only the position but the the way that, that referees engage. You know, we've all laughed at some of the things that Nigel Owens has said over the years. We all have a chuckle at that, and yes, that kind of light heartedness I think is an, is an, is an important trait. But everyone needs to be themselves. Everyone needs to bring their own their own personality and and, and their own style. Um, the referees that I look up to, the the ones that I high rate very very highly at the moment, I think that the, the top two referees in the world are Luke Pearce and Angus Gardner. Um, not necessarily because of the accuracy of their decision making. I think there are some other referees that are maybe a little bit more accurate, but the way that they manage the game and the way that they engage with players is the kind of referee that that, that I would like to be. I think the, the way that they communicate is absolutely fantastic. I love to watch them referee. And then the up, up and coming guys, um, Christoph Ridley. I would say that I'm a member of the Leicester, Leicester Referee Society. Christoph came through the Leicester Referee Society and is now at the very top. You know, will he be the best referee in the world at one point? I think he probably will. Um, but he's, I've, I've met the guy a couple of times. I was really, really grounded. He, he's come and done some training sessions for us within the, in the Leicestershire Referee Society. Um, and one of the one of the things that he said in, in the first session that I have, I, one of my very, very first training sessions back in, in the day when I first started um, was with Christoph Ridley. And one of the things that he said that stuck with me ever since is his perception of what the difference is between what we do at the grassroots and what he does at the at the elite level. And I think at the time he was just breaking into the, the premiership, um, certainly as an AR, whether or not he'd refereed, I, I, I don't know, because it's a couple of years ago now. But what he said was, there's a massive difference between who his customer is and who my customer is at the grassroots. So for him, his customers are the and if it's at Walford Road, the 25, 27,000 people that are in the stand and however many hundred thousand are watching at home. When he's at the World Cup, his customer is again the, you know, 40, 50, 60,000 people that are in the stand and however many hundred thousand or million people are, are watching at home. They're his customers. My customer are the 30 guys that pulled on a shirt for their local team to run out with their mates and have a laugh, smash into someone, make some tackles, have a few beers afterwards. They're my customers, not the people that are watching on the sideline, the people that are playing the game. Now, that's true of the, the Sunday morning age grade stuff as well, Sunday afternoon, the uh, 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 female age grade and, and, and female senior rugby. True throughout grassroots rugby, as a referee, your customer are the people on the field that are there playing the game, not anyone that's watching the game. And that, I think, is an important thing and something that I certainly remind myself of um, when I'm pulling my boots on on a, on a Saturday afternoon, that I'm there to facilitate 30 guys, 30 girls, whatever, playing rugby, not to make it a spectacle for the people on the sideline. Yeah, absolutely. Now, you've sort of mentioned prep there. Um is there anything else that's that you think about? Any because obviously, like I'm very familiar with what I would do to prep to play a rugby game. Mm -hmm. Are there similarities in terms of prepping to referee a game, or are there some minor yeah. differences as well? Well, oh, Tim, I think um, I think that's that, that's that's a fantastic question because I think it's something that a lot of players won't appreciate at all. That they will probably just see the referee pull up into the car park an hour before kickoff get changed and then referee a rugby, have a couple of pints afterwards and off he goes and think that that's the referee involvement. I'm not going to lie. Some referees, that that is absolutely it. No Referees are no different to players, Tim, really. There are some players in a club, you know, everyone will know a player in their club who turns up on a Saturday, half an hour before kickoff, puts his boots on, runs around for a bit, has a few beers, disappears. Never see him at midweek training. We've all got guys that are a club like that 
referees are no different. There are some referees that are that are like that. Equally, we've all got players at our local club who are playing on a Saturday and that's all they've thought about all Saturday morning. And then they go and play rugby. On a Sunday, they may be involved in the club and do something with the juniors. On a Monday, they'll probably do some kind of active recovery session. Tuesday, they're back at the club senior training. Wednesday, they're probably hitting the gym. Thursday, they'll be back at the club for senior training. Friday, they're in bed early and they've eaten something sensible because they're then playing rugby on a Saturday afternoon. Referees are no different. There are some referees that will adopt exactly the same kind of attitude to, to their rugby. So I'm somewhere in the middle, if I'm honest with you, Tim. I, you know, I'm, I'm not taking it that seriously, but equally, I don't just turn up and, uh, and referee. So for me, my, my game on a Saturday starts on a Thursday night where I will check where I'm going to be. I should have had confirmation from the home team by that point. If I haven't had confirmation, then I will chase them because I want to confirm kickoff times, parking arrangements, pitch selection, changing facilities, shirt colours, you know, all these things, uh, all these things that are often overlooked, but they're things that you need to just kind of check off your list. Um, I'll also then at that point check uh, if it's a league fixture, where the clubs are in the league, what the current form is. Try not to be too, too detailed on that because at my level, you know, just a level eight referee, the the fixture can swing massively on availability. So the fact that a club has played really well for the last two weekends doesn't necessarily mean they're going to play really well this weekend because they could actually have, of their, their squad of you know 18 players, they could have nine that's totally different to what it was last weekend because of availability. That's just you know the way of things. I'll also make sure my kit's sorted in my kit bag, ready to go. Um, then Saturday morning, do the last prep. So I'll be looking at things like weather, traffic, making sure that I'm you know, taking the right route. If I'm anywhere in the centre of Leicester, I'll check our city at home or at Tigers at home because that's going to impact my journey time and I want to make sure I'm there on time. Um, that's just for the Saturday game. Generally, Tuesday, Wednesday, I'll be training myself, you know, getting my, my fitness level up or maintaining it through, through the course of the season. It isn't just about rocking up. There's, there's, there's a large amount of, of preparation that's needed to to deliver a product for the guys that are running around, you know, and, and, and that I think is a big part of it. The other thing that I think, uh, uh, you know, is, is a, a myth that's worth dispelling. Um, as a, as a grassroots referee, we don't get paid. You know, there's, there's a lot of players that, that clubs that, that think that because the club pays for the referee, that the referee gets paid. Well, that's not the case. We do it on a voluntary basis. There was a discussion at, um, at our last AGM, uh, sorry, the last one, the, the one before us, to whether or not that could be used as a mechanism to recruit more referees and to retain more referees. Um, and the consensus was it might, but we don't want it. And the reason that we don't want it is that all of us want to be able to, to, to stand there in, a, in that situation that very rarely happens, very rarely happens to him, but just be able to say, I'm here as a volunteer. You're not going to speak to me like that. That is not appropriate. I'm here as a volunteer to facilitate your game of rugby. At the point that there's a transaction involved, and I, you know, you see this in, in football, you see this in football at the grassroots, there's a transaction involved. It's not a big transaction. It's, you know, 20, 30 quid for, for refereeing a game of football. But all of a sudden, the mentality shifts. Mm -hmm. You're there as a paid resource, and all of a sudden you become almost fair game. And I, I don't want that at all. So I think that's that's a, a myth that is, that is worth worth dispelling. The couple of pints afterwards, the, the pie and chips, love that. Absolutely. You know, take we'll take, take that on. Um, but yeah, you know, the, the preparation is a big, big part of, of what we do, just like it is for the players, you know, just like it is for the players. Yeah, that's brilliant to hear all of that detail because it is very easy to overlook all that kind of stuff, along with a lot of other stuff that happens in rugby as well. Yeah. Any advice, Matt, for people either considering picking up the whistle or sort of new referees uh, that have just got started? What would be your thoughts around that? So I think, Tim, if um, if you're a currently active player considering hanging up your boots, what I would say is, you know, based on my own experience and, and, and referees that I've spoken to that have had a similar kind of journey to me, is if you can hang up your boots, pick up a whistle, give it a go. What's the worst that could happen? You know, try it at the junior level. It's it's a lot easier. There's more of a kind of safety net around doing some um, some some junior rugby. Try it. You you might like it. In terms of 
progressing. So if you if you do do give it a go, and you uh, and you enjoy it, and you you, you want to progress, I would say that the, the big two things to to do are to learn the laws of the game, which you can do by watching rugby. I think watching it more than reading the law book. The law book is a is a reference point, not how you actually referee the game. Because you know, I'm sure you'll have, you've heard many people say, if we refereed the game to the law book, we'd never play more than about 10 seconds of rugby at any one point before we blew the whistle. And that's just not what anyone wants to to partake in or to or to watch. Um, and I think the, the certainly from from my perspective, my journey, the thing that has unlocked it is increasing my fitness. Now, I didn't go from playing straight into refereeing and therefore had a, a level of fitness that I just needed to maintain. I had a period of time away from uh, from rugby where my fitness plummeted and I then needed to, to build it back up. But being a, a fit referee unlocks your positioning, which unlocks decision making, which unlocks credibility, which just it's, it's one of those kind of early dominoes. If you can flick over fitness, everything else kind of follows um, uh, follows down. I would also say let things go that don't matter. It's probably the, the in terms of refereeing style. I mean, if it doesn't have a material impact, don't worry about it. Think about it for a second. You'd be surprised how long you've got when you first start refereeing. The game seems fast, even at grassroots, low level vet stuff. It seems fast. You've got thirty moving parts all going around at the same time, and you're trying to work out what's going on. It can be quite intimidating from that perspective. But actually, if you just take a step back and wait, let your brain process the information, then blow your whistle or don't blow your whistle. You're not, don't, don't feel under any pressure to make a quick decision. I think you're better off making a correct decision a second later than making the, the wrong decision a second earlier. Does that make sense? 100%. Absolutely. It's so easy to just jump and be very reactive, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, I want to dig a little bit deeper. Give me a couple of examples, maybe, or define a little uh, tighter material effect when it comes to rugby. Materiality. So this is something that is, um, so this is kind of loosely defined in, in, in law. So a, a material gain would be a tactic. So you've gained tactically, or you've gained in terms of, of, of territory. That's a very simplistic way of looking at it, um, because you would then possibly be able to argue the case that if you're playing with penalty advantage and you kick the ball upfield, you've made a territorial gain advantage over. Well, is it really advantage over at that point? Have you actually made a material gain? Probably not. So, you know, potentially come back for, for that. And that's an area where, you know, we all have our own interpretations and it's an area where I think it's, um, I think, a fascinating area of the game because different referees will, will approach that in, in, a, in a different style. But it's in terms of what is material and what isn't, it's, it's got to be match affecting. So things that I will quite often let slide will be, um, you know, you've you've got a a, a tackle situation. You've got the, the the ball carrier is is on the ground and he's in the process of of placing the ball back. You've got the first player that comes in attempting uh, attempting a jackal. He's got his hands on the ball. It's, it's cleared out. Okay. Now, is that clear out safe and legal? If that clear out is safe and legal, and there was no attempt to lift, which which play on, you know, where you've got a pass that is very flat, <laughs> is it material? No. Does it really matter? No. Another good example that uh, that, that happens more often than, than not at the grassroots level is scrum time. The, the ball is at the eight feet and a prop loses his bind. The scrum's still stable and safe, you know, and it's not collapsed because we generally would blow for that. At the elite level, they would say play away, but at the grassroots would generally blow for that because it could be a safety issue. Everyone's got work on a Monday morning. Um, but where you've got, you know, prop loser the vine, that, that technically is an infringement. Does it matter? Does it make any difference at all? Does, does possession change? No. The one I mentioned uh, earlier about the, the, the line out, something that the World Rugby are bringing into law trial, I think, in the Southern Hemisphere. Defensive team don't chuck someone up. The ball isn't straight in the line out. We already play on. It's about pragmatism. Does, did it have a material impact? No. Um, midfield defence, you know, if, if, if the, you've got people running dummy lines, if they're not taking someone out of the game, is it material? No, it's, it's, it's not material. We, we, we play on. And that, I think, is a, it is a default position that I think a lot of referees would be well advised to get into, which is assess the materiality. Did it make any difference to, to the game? No. Well, in that case, we, we play on. 
you know, marginal decisions. You know, I, I would always tend to favour the attacking team. If, if there's an opportunity, if there's a 50-50, I'll generally favour the attacking team because it's about keeping the game flowing. It's about something that is as, as close as we can at the grassroots level where we don't have the fitness. We don't have, let's be honest, we don't have the skill level. We don't have the physical capability that they do at the elite level, but we all want to try to play at that standard. We all want to try and play that style and that brand of rugby. The reality is we can't. Let's be honest with ourselves, Tim. We can't do that, can we? So I think you need a referee that is going to not not pick up on some of those minor little things to just let the game flow. Now, if you can string together six phases at level eight rugby, that's, that's pretty good. Six phases at level 10 rugby, unheard of. You know, <laughs> 100%. And uh, well, I think that's a great way to uh, finish this part of the show before we move on to the stash section, Matt. Now, okay. before we actually ask the stash questions, I want to know, do referees look at referees' stash, you know, at the top level and go, cool, that's a cracking referees kit? Have you seen the watches that they all get issued? No. Yeah. So they, they all get issued. Um, so certainly at the World Cup, they get issued a very, very expensive watch. So yes, do we look on that with, with Envy? We absolutely do. Particularly because they don't actually need their watch on their wrist because there's a fella in the, uh, the person, sorry, in the stands running the clock. So they don't need a swanky watch, but they, they all get one. So yes, we do have Envy on the uh, on, on the referee stash. Um, in terms of my, my pick, um, it's a really, really naff example, but it's something that, um, that does actually mean, uh, mean a bit to me, mean a lot to me. Um, it's this, this whistle. I'll, probably, I'll send you a photo so you can put it up on the screen because it's not going to come across very well on, on the camera. But this is, um, this is the, the RFU issued referee that they issue to referees that go and do the RFU level, um, level stuff, you know, so level five and above catered by the uh, by the RFU and this was this was gifted to me by one of the other referees in the Leicestershire Society um uh, Jenny Burrows um who does you know kind of women's pram high level you know it's a very very good uh, good referee um and she gave me that as a um uh, as a as a token and I, I really appreciate that I don't use it on a Saturday afternoon my preference is this style of referee that uh, referee this style of referee whistle <laughs> that that fits onto my fingers like that but I do use that for for coaching. So that that's my kind of pick of the best stash that I've ever received, which is a gift from another referee. That's the RFU branded. It's got the little rose on it. Um, lovely, uh, <laughs> lovely whistle. Sounds exactly the same as every other um, uh, Acme Thunderer ref uh, referee whistle. Um, but yeah, that's my my pick of stash. That's a great one. So um, yeah, very uh, completely unique. What about your favourite kit of all time? So this could be any team or any referee's kit if you wanted to go down that route. Um, so uh, obviously I knew you were going to ask me this question. So I did a bit, bit of thinking about it and um, I very nearly picked the, uh, the Southern Hemisphere, the Super 14 kit that's branded by, uh, sorry, that's sponsored by Specsavers because I think that that's um, a nice bit of tongue in cheek um, uh, advertising. And that's, that, that, that's quite clever. Um, but I'm actually going to pick one shirt, not even a team shirt. I'm going to pick one shirt from uh, from history, something that any of the young viewers probably aren't even aware of, but the likes of you and I will remember um, fondly. Um, so as um, not, not touched on, on what I do for a living, but I, I, um, I run a, a company, Action Apps. We do um, uh, athlete management for, for elite sports, um, primarily football. Love to break into rugby. So if there's anyone that's interested in athlete management and performance management watching, get in touch. Um, <laughs> So the, 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 it's all about marginal gains and you know, the whole David Brailsford. You know, if you can if you can gain something, um, a tactical advantage, and you know, shave weight off a bike. So I'm going to pick the shirt that David Sol wore against England in 1991, where he cut off his sleeve to prevent Jeff Probin, who was a cracking scrummager, prevent Jeff Probin getting a bind on his sleeve, which is now illegal. You wouldn't be able to bind on the sleeve. Um, you also, interestingly, can't cut your sleeves off. So I don't know well, actually if that's a law change that was a direct result of what David Sol did, but you can't bind on the sleeve, so you wouldn't have needed to. Um, and you now can't cut your sleeve off. There's a, that's the it states in law that the, your um, uh, your jersey must come down your uh, your arm. But yeah, he cut his sleeve off to prevent Jeff Probin getting a, a bind and being able to what these days we would call crank, which is to basically take the uh, take the loose head shoulder down so that you can drive up and, and destabilize him. Um, but he did that to gain an advantage, which 
was very, very good thinking. You know, you think of that, again, I'll come down to the kind of David Brailsford mindset of marginal gains. If you can take something quite small and gain an advantage from it, all well and good. So I'm going to I'm going to say that's my, my favourite shirt. Obviously, England beat Scotland in that game. So I can look back on that with a smile on my face. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that I think is, um, uh, is worthy of uh, um, my favourite shirt of all time. Wonderful. What a great story to go with it as well. And Jeff Probin, by the way, still scrummages. Uh, I think every single uh, dinner or event he goes to, I've got so many photos of him scrummaging in the bar against somebody who wants to have a little crack. Um, so he's a good man, Jeff. Uh, what about Awful Kit? What kits do you dislike at the moment? So um, I'm going to go with a local example, one that you've almost certainly never, never seen um, with a very, very specific reason for it, um, which is a very selfish reason. So forgive me for in, in, indulging myself on this, but it's Shepshed RFC. So if anyone from Shepshed RFC is watching, big shout out to um, uh, to you guys. Um, obviously I refereed you just a couple of months ago. Um, and I refereed them in a, uh, a league decider. So Leicestershire Merit C, um, one of the last games of the season, Leicester Forest, if they won the game, we're going to win the league. And they were playing Shepshed. Shepshed's kit is black. Their numbers were printed on their shirt with a kind of um, a, a black centre with a white outline to it. The white outline on the majority of their shirts has come off. So they've got a black number on a black shirt. I was being assessed in this game. Now, one of the things that as a referee, your good practice of a referee is what we call colour number action. So when you're speaking to a player to give them an instruction, you would say, blue seven, no, blue seven, hands away. Red three, roll. So you've got colour, number, action. You've told a specific player to perform a specific thing. You can't do that when you've got no shirt numbers. So one of the criteria that I'm going to be assessed against is, do I, the majority of times, nine times out of ten, do I get colour, number, action? Particularly at the breakdown, it's quite often, majority of the time is at the breakdown, you need to tell a player a preventative call, as we call it. You can't do that when you, you don't know the shirt number. So that is I'm what I'm going to pick as the as the worst kit um, because it makes refereeing them an absolute nightmare. And thankfully, uh, the, the assessor that I had on the day was, was pragmatic and he realised quite quickly that the reason that I was not doing colour number action for Shep Shed was that I didn't know what their, what their number was. I could just go, you know, black, hands away, black roll, black, back on side, whatever, whatever the instruction was. Um, so, yeah, so that's the, that's the worst kit, I think. Kit without numbers on makes the, makes the referee job really hard. <laughs> Challenges are absolutely everywhere when you're a referee. Um, okay, we'll bring this to a close now, Matt. Uh, it's been absolutely fascinating for me and hopefully for listeners as well, getting into the mind of a referee and the challenges uh, that go along with it. But there, are there any sort of closing thoughts that you've got or any sort of last things you want to say to sum up? Uh, I guess the, the only other thing that we've not delved into that, um, that I'd like to shout out is... Um, is respect. We've, we've touched on it, but I think that is that is an area that is something that I'd like to see as a, as, a, as a trend that's happening. I'd like to see it reversed. And it's not just match officials that are on the receiving end. It's visible to me because I am one. But I think that there's a, a, a growing um, a growing problem with a lack of respect in the game. Coaches to coaches, coaches to players, players to coaches, spectators. I think everyone in the game can step up and do a better job of themselves and representing themselves in terms of how they respect other people that are involved in the game. So I think a, for a, a parting comment from me would be, we can all do better at this and it will benefit all of us and it will benefit the game. Yeah, perfect. Okay, brilliant. If people want to get hold of you, Matt, what is the best way for them to do that? Um, you can you can find all of my contact info on my About Me page, which is about.me slash Matt Groves with two Ts. Um, obviously, we'll put the link in the um, uh, in the video description. I'm sure, um, but yeah, that's me. I'm not massively active on social media, if I'm perfectly honest, Tim. But um, but yeah, if anyone wants to reach out, contact info is up there. Absolutely delighted to uh, uh, to hear from you. Yeah, brilliant. As Matt said, then I will link absolutely everything in the show notes, which you can find in one place at amateurrugbypodcast.com. So it just leaves me to say, Matt, thanks so much for your time today and, and really valuable insight. Lovely. It's been really, really fun, Sam. I've really enjoyed the experience. Thank you very much for having me on. Good man. Good man. Okay. There he goes. Thanks again to Matt. It's 
there's so many facets to being a referee and I just think the more people understand all the details and you know I'm sure there's loads more that we could have gone into as well actually uh, but the more people understand the more people will have empathy with referees and decisions that are made or not made depending on the circumstances now if you've enjoyed this podcast you can do all the social media stuff if you like but what I'd really like is if you mention it to someone in person the next time you're down your local rugby club so until then get out and play